Okay, well, it's good to be here. Uh, it's, it's really good to be here. It's good to be here feeling a whole lot better. Um, three or four weeks ago, um, we, we did a study on the uh, letter or book of uh, Lamentations and uh, talking about all of the, you know, the, the destruction and the bad things and the what a terrible, terrible time it, it, it must have been for the people in uh, in Jerusalem and in, in Judea and, that, you know, in, in that whole area. And uh, I said at the time, you know, that we, we need to hear the good side, too. Uh, you know, while we all know that there's a good side and, and we know and I don't remember where I was, but just the other day. And of course, I've heard other people say this many times. I said, you know, we may go through a lot. We may be killed. We may. There's no telling what's going to happen to us. But I've read the end of the book and we win. And uh, I know you all know that. And uh, uh, so uh, today what I want to do is I want to talk mostly about some of the good things that we can look forward to. Now, are they in the millennium, these scriptures? Are they about the millennium or are they about the eighth day or the last great day or, or the, the uh, fairness doctrine or whatever, uh, you know, however you want to look at it? You know, I don't know. I, I seem to think most of it has to do with the millennium, but, um, you know, I've heard too many too many sermons over the years where we had it all figured out. I mean, we knew down to the detail, you know, who was going to be uh, in, in charge. We had the hierarchy. You all remember, all you all, the ones that have been around 30 years, uh, you, you know, all the different things that we've heard in, in sermons. So I, I'm not going to pin down or try to pin down when these things uh, are going to occur. But my personal opinion is that most of it would be millennial. Uh, but that's just my personal opinion, which is worth zero. It's worth what you're paying for it. Um, so, uh, you know, you know what I like to say, Skip, on that note? What's that, Michael? We don't know, we, we don't know when this stuff's going to happen, but we can take it to the bank and we know for sure that it is going to happen. And that should be sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true. And and uh, another thing, and I probably shouldn't be saying this, but you all know me. I say I shouldn't say it, and then I go ahead and say it. But I heard a, a program the other day um, where there was a gentleman on there that that was basically dating the return of Christ. And I, th I think he was dating more of a year than than a than a day, but you know, uh, you know, I, I was like, aren't aren't we through with that stuff? Haven't haven't we had had enough wrong dates that we haven't learned our lesson? And uh, so, uh, and then then I heard another. Uh, uh, it was a sermon, but it's turned out to be a two parter. And I think there's going to be a third part. And it was on false prophets. Uh, and the first hour that I listened to, and, and, and please don't question me on why I listened for a whole hour. But anyway, the whole hour was about the Ill evils of the worldwide church of God. Name names, name pastors, name, you know, the ministers that were saying, you know, false things and all this kind of stuff. And I, I, I was like, can't we ever, ever get over that? Because I feel like our audience should be new people. It should be people who haven't gone through all of that. And so why do we spend our time talking about all of that old stuff, even though, and Michael and I talked about this yesterday, it, it can be therapeutic. And, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with it as long as we don't dwell on it all the time. And I went through a personal 
period of time that was very, very hard on me. And um, I had to go into my computer and into my paper file folder and and remove every comment that I had made to this person or this person had made to me. We were on a board together and I, I kept rehashing it over and over and over and doing what ifs. Well, what if I had, you know, or I wish I'd have. Now that, that's the way I put it. You know, I wish I'd have said such and such. And it was tearing me apart. So I think it's time to get away from that stuff and to talk about grace and faith and love and you know things things like that 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 will do us more good than rehashing all of the old stuff now i i'm not saying that we should never do that i'm just expressing my opinion that i'm hearing too much of that stuff online uh and and i i'm ready to 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 not hear it anymore and and by the way i did express my opinion about that uh, to the, the, you know, where, where the, the, the guy was on dating the return of Christ. And, and I called the, the, the people in charge and they're friends of mine. And I said, look, it's time, please. It's, let's not do this again. Okay. Sorry. I, I hope I haven't ruined uh, today's, today's Bible study, but thinking back on the 4th of July this year, and it, we call the birth date uh, of the United States of America after years of abuse uh, from England, L the leaders of the 13 colonies signed a document uh, that we call the Declaration of Independence. They declared their independence and they said they weren't going to be subject to the British crown any longer. And there's there's been a lot of negative talk about specifically slavery, how, uh, well, I thought the Declaration of Independence declared that we were free. Well, there was still slavery. Well, the Declaration of Independence was independence from England. It, 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 it wasn't a declaration that's, that said, we're gonna get rid of all the evils in the United States effective, you know, July the 4th, 1776. Um, so, uh, slavery was slavery was bad. It was a scourge on this land, and and we know that that there was a lot more to slavery in both sides and all of that than 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 uh, uh, people say. But um, anyway, now we're tearing down statues. We're rewriting history. I say we, you know what that means, um, and and I'm I'm like, well, wait a minute, if 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 we if we get rid of our history, how in the world are we going to learn anything? How's the next generation going to know anything if we've torn down all the statues of the people that we think were bad? Well, we need a statue of a of a bad guy or or a or a document about a bad guy. So we'll know we're, we don't want that to happen again. So anyway, uh, every single man that signed that document was an Englishman. And most of them spoke with distinct English accents. They were born under the crown. They lived under the crown. They had sworn loyalty to the crown. And because of a certain amount of stupidity on the part of the king and, and, and parliament, the, the provocations were more than the colonists of North America could bear. And so they rebelled. Even though they had signed and had sworn loyalty to the crown. Well, you, you know, you can only be loyal so long when somebody's beating you with a whip. So they declared their independence from the crown. Now, I love this country, 
but I'm not real happy with it right now. I'm certainly not happy with the political environment that we have, and I'm really not happy about the hatred. You know, somebody posted on Facebook the other day, said, you know, what? what's the one thing you would get rid of if you could? And I responded, I usually don't respond, but I responded, I said, hatred. We have so much hatred in this world, and we can't look at the other person's point of view. We just can't. And, and, we, and we can't talk about things because... I'm right, you're wrong, period. Let's not discuss it. If we do discuss it, I'm going to be yelling and screaming and cussing at you all day long. You know, I, I don't understand that. Uh, and as you all know, I go to a Bible study every Wednesday morning, and I have learned to not yell and scream. I've learned to not argue and fuss and fight. I've learned how to express my opinion without making everybody mad. I've learned how to express my opinion as an opinion and, and just simply say, here's the way I understand that scripture. Now, they can't argue with that. They can say, well, here's the way I understand that scripture. Fine. But they can't tell me, no, Skip, you can't understand that scripture that way. I learned that from Ron Dart one time. Uh, but anyway. But I have some good news. There's a new world coming, and it's a whole lot better than this one. And you all know that. Everyone knows that the word gospel translated <clears throat> means good news. That God, while he has left man to his own devices, you know, and that's another of my of my thoughts. I don't think God is directing traffic anymore. I think God, I really do, folks. I, I, I think God is sitting back and saying, you know, you guys do your thing and I'm going to show you how wrong you are one of these days. Now, that's a, that's just me talking again. Um, but I don't think God has abandoned us. I think God has a plan. The plan is in motion. The plan is working. But, you know, he didn't ask me about different parts of his plan. And I don't think he asked any of you all either. Yes, we pray and we ask God for whatever it is that we ask God for. But he doesn't ask us our opinion on whether, you know, he should, you know, whatever. Okay. So there, there is good news, and, and it, it's gonna, there's going to be a better world than this because God is going to send his son, which is part of the plan that was set up before there was a, even a creation, but he's going to send his son back to this earth to fix this mess that we humans have made of his creation. And I'm not talking about global warming and all that stuff. I'm just, I'm just saying we, you know, our attitudes, the way we treat people, uh, wars, and and you know, nations can't get along with nations, and 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 neighbors can't get along with neighbors, and all that kind of stuff. The Christ is going to come back, and He's going to fix it. Now, another opinion I have is that it's he's not going to fix it. He's not going to come down here, land on the Mount of Olives, snap his fingers, and all is well. Uh, I, I think it's going to take a long time. And you know, they, they kind of give us a little hint that it's going to take a thousand years to get it back up into the shape that it needs to be before a whole bunch of people are going to be resurrected. To live on this earth, but I, I'm not going into the last great day, but you all understand that. Now, one of the earliest prophets to begin speaking of this good news was a man named Isaiah. And if you remember from a, a long time ago, uh, we went through Isaiah 59, 
And Isaiah 59 is not a happy chapter. It's kind of the opposite of what I'm going to be, hopefully we'll be talking about today. So Isaiah has covered it. You know, he he's, he covers both both ends of it, the good, the bad and, and, and the good. And he had a whole lot of things to say about the kingdom of God. Uh, he, he talked about a time in the future when God is going to rule on the earth. The Father. And the Son's going to do it first, but, you know, read, read the end of the book of Revelation, and it talks about God's throne is coming down to the earth. And there's going to be no more sin and no more hatred and no more, you know, you, you all know what it says in Revelation 21. And so Isaiah told the people of his day, there's a new world coming and it's better than this. And Isaiah loved Israel. He loved Jerusalem. And I, again, as I always do, forgot to put my clicker in. So bear with me a sec. Anybody have anything to say while I'm doing this, by the way? Okay. So he, he uh, uh, I'm going to cover a little of the bad and, and then we'll go into some of the good. How is the faithful city become a harlot? Speaking specifically about Jerusalem. It was full of judgment. It was full of righteousness. I'm sorry, it was full of judgment and righteousness lodged in it. But now murderers. Does that sound anything like the country we're living in today? Does it sound like hundreds of countries and, and cities across this world and what a mess they're in. You know, we're in a mess, but our mess is not near as bad as as, as the the mess is in uh, a lot of other a lot of other other countries. Verse twenty three: Your princes are rebellious, and companions of thieves. Everybody loves gifts. Let's see. We elect a congressman. For a salary of what, $200,000 a year, and in 10 years, he's a multimillionaire. How does that work? Well, it doesn't work with interest at 1%. I can assure you that. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. Does our Congress follow after rewards? If somebody gives them a $100,000 check illegally, do they not get their ear? They judge not the fatherless. Neither does the cause of the widow come to them. They, they, don't, they don't care. And, and he's talking about Jerusalem, but it, it works for the United States too. With all the political posturing that we have today about the care of widows and orphans, much of it's an act. You know, you hear these guys, oh, we've got a, you know, and then they do nothing. Oh yeah, what they do is they pass a bill and they raise a bunch of money and all that money goes to their buddies, except for maybe 10%. Well, shame on you, Skip. It's always for the children. Oh yes, I, I apologize, Michael. I know I've got an attitude about this. I was gonna say Jim, Jim Williams had his hand raised. Okay, Jim. Well, I was just going to say the same thing. The, the last part of this, is what they run on every two or six years. And in between the every two or six years, all they're doing is spending money and passing legislation so that they can get reelected. Yeah. And then say, we're going to take care of the fatherless, the widows, uh, you know, blacks, anyone that's oppressed. We're going to take care of that. Uh, and then they go back to raising money for the next two years. Yeah. And it's all, and about it's just, I, I mean, this just describes, this describes our political system. It isn't the intent, which was go and serve for a few years and then go back home and 
do your business. Yeah. Wasn't supposed to be a full-time job. So it's, it's, you know, it, it's all about staying in power. And, and it was probably the same way in, uh, in, in Jerusalem and in, in Judea. Uh, and, and so this prophecy is, I think, maybe more relevant today in many ways than it was then. But, you know, maybe we've, you know, I've probably already violated my initial comment about let's not talk about, you know, the blah, 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 because we talk about it all the time. So I apologize. Let's go on with this. Uh, Isaiah uh, uh, verse 24 through 26, God says, therefore, now, why did he say therefore? Because the princes are rebellious. They're the companions of thieves because everyone loves gifts. And then he says, therefore, says Yahweh, the Yahweh of hosts. I'm not sure, is one of you all that does Hebrew better than I do, I'm not, I don't know what the, the Hebrew word for host is, but anyway, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will ease me of my adversaries. Think about that one. I'm getting rid of my enemies, Jack. They're gonna be gone. And I'm going to avenge me of my enemies. Now, I, I think we all understand that because God has blinded so many people, and because you know that you you were born in the wrong place, and so your parents aren't Christians, and uh, so you didn't raise you, you weren't raised up a Christian, and all this kind of stuff. That these people are going to get a chance at life way down the road. So keep that in mind. It, when, when God says, I'm gonna avenge me of my ad, uh, enemies and, and uh, that's temporary, uh, but he's gonna fix it. He is gonna fix it. And he says, and I'm gonna turn my hand on you and surely purge away your dross and take away all your tin. Yeah, and I, I think by, by 10, he's talking about things that we may think is are valuable, but they're not, they're nothing. Like gold and silver and cars and trucks and homes and, you know, all, all of that kind of stuff. He says, and I'm going to restore good judges just like I did when Israel came out of, of, of Egypt and, and left uh, uh you know, Mount Sinai, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Think about that. What's it going to take, even by the Almighty God, what's it going to take to turn the hearts of those judges or to put new judges in? It's going to take a lot of work. And God has asked us to help with that work. He doesn't need us, but he's giving us the privilege to help clean this mess up. There's a better world coming. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. And the destruction of the transgressors and the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake Yahweh will be consumed. Again, I, I believe temporarily there, there will be some that, that will permanently uh, be, be destroyed. Uh, you know, not, not 100% based on what I read in the scriptures are going to make it. I don't understand why. But based on, you know, the reading of scriptures, there will be some people thrown in the lake of fire. You know, we, we read that. Anyway, for they shall be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you shall be confounded for the gardens that you have chosen. I think he's talking about the groves there where, where uh, um, Israel uh, began to worship uh, the, the pagan gods and and so forth at the 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 they'd worship the Asherah they uh, Molech and 
uh, you know, every time I think of Molech, I think of, of abortion. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a, uh, I don't know if it's a metaphor, but you know, they, they threw newborn babies into the fire. Well, what does that sound like? Well, anyway, okay. Isaiah verse uh, 130, for you shall be as an oak whose leaf fades and as a garden that doesn't have any water. Hey, Skip. Uh, yeah, Mark. I think this is talking about Jerusalem as the inheritor, or let's let's put it this way. It's talking about Jerusalem as part of God's plan to uh, bring his throne to the, to the nation of Israel. Remember we've talked, or I've brought up in the past, you start out with, with God in, the, in Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and then you have the Mount Sinai situation, and then God establishing a nation and the, the likeness or parallelism of Jerusalem being where the throne of God was, the temple located there and this sort of thing. So everything that you're saying, it's even, uh, th there's a view that we shouldn't forget that this is, this is even more heinous because we have a nation who has rejected God's throne among them. They weren't just kind of scumbaggy, but they were totally rejecting the throne of God being among them. And so, um, you know, I, I'm pretty sure where you're going with this is the eventually, or or at least you're going to talk about it some, is that, as you've already mentioned, about the um, uh, the city the new Jerusalem, et cetera, which is another iteration of this same story. Yeah. And wh when it mentions about the Lord of hosts, that's a euphemism or a term for the armies of God. Uh, you know, Yahweh, the leader of the armies of heaven, so to speak, and he is saying, this is pretty important, folks, because I'm going to come and wipe you out. Yeah. The, the, you know what? When, when you were talking about that, I've never thought of this before, and you all may all jump up and say, Skip, uh, here you go again. But, you know, Jerusalem kind of reminds me of the, the prodigal son that has left. And then he's going to come he's going to come back and, and be welcomed back and so on. And I know that, that it's not really a metaphor of this, but I'm going to have to think about that. Cause that, you know, as, as you were going through that, you know, Jerusalem had the best, were the best. And God said, I want you folks to be the priests of the world. Well, what's a priest? Isn't a priest someone whose job it is to, teach, to help, to, to uh, work for God. And Israel said, nope, we don't want to be, yeah, we don't want to do that. We want to go have fun. So anyway, thanks, Mark. That was, uh, and yes, you're right. That's exactly where I'm going. Uh, well, and they'll execute judgment, righteous judgment. Yeah. So so often through the old, really, and the New Testament, you don't just see judgment. You see righteous judgment, the two words together. Yeah. And we have judgment here, but relatively little righteous judgment. You know, one of the things that comes to mind is, as Mark was talking, and you, you, and you, you mentioned this quite a bit, Skip, the number of times that uh, Israel and Jerusalem in particular deliberately rejected God. Uh, like, like Mark said, they weren't just a bunch of, as he put it, scumbags. Uh, these are people that were the, the people of the Lord that said, no, we don't want you. 
And of course, you read how many times that, you know, God, you know, judged them. They went into captivity. They were punished. They, you know, begged for forgiveness. God relented, brought them back. And, you know, this cycle repeats itself. One of the things to keep in mind is these things where God is going to make Jerusalem, you know, the center. He's going to restore his people, Israel, and, and set them up is not because of anything that the people did. That the, I can't remember off the top of my head, but that God says in Scripture, He's doing this for the sake of His own word, because He's the one that declared it and decreed it from the beginning. So He's going to bring it to fruition because He said so. It has nothing to do with anything we do or anything we think, or uh, that there's any righteousness in us. God is going to bring His, his nation, uh, Israel, back to the place He desires it because that's what He said He was going to do. At the outset, I will make you a, a great nation. All nations will flow into you. And so those, God is being true to his word uh, when all these things are, are going to happen. It's not, you know, because of anything that the, the people themselves do. I just, I just was thinking about that as Mark was talking and as Jim was talking. Yeah, Israel basically slapped God in the face. Uh, you know, God says, I'm going to do all of this stuff. You're going to be great. You're going to lead the world. And they slap him in the face and say, you know, we, we don't need you. We're, you know, we're great and wonderful. And, uh, you know, what is it? Uh, pride goeth before the fall. So, yeah. Um, right, so so yeah. I, I just add to this that it has been typical uh, for us to look at some of these prophecies in uh, this book of Isaiah as meaning trying to interpret them in the light of our country, of our nation state. And I think that we've missed a dimension here by seeing it um, from a humanistic point of view in the sense of, okay, the, the nation, okay? And we when you look at the grand story, this is much more powerful in that God is talking about his kingdom, his city on the hill, his mountain, his new Jerusalem. Like it says in Hebrews 11 and 12, we haven't come to just some random place, but we've come to the, you know, we come right to the group of people who are the uh, the 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 faithful that are mentioned in Hebrews 11 that's what this is about it's a it's a grand story not just a story about the united states that we view from our perspective it's a story about what's god god is doing for the uh, the, the culmination of history. Yeah, and I think you're right. I think, and I even have so far today kind of gone a, a little, a little too far in trying to point some of this to the United States. He's talking about Israel. He's talking about Judea. He's talking about Jerusalem. And uh, I need to, I need to, <laughs> you know, keep my focus on that. Yes, it applies to other, other places. Um, it's a warning to every human being, but, but you're exactly right. And, and, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to keep this focused on, on Jerusalem because that's, that's what God's talking about here. He loves Jerusalem. Abraham was his buddy. And he said, Hey, Abraham, I'm going to give you a nation. I mean, an area of land and your people are going to be great, and your people are going to be leaders of the world, and the Savior's coming through your loins. And one of the things that just blows me away is how Jewish people don't even respect their motherland. They hate it. But anyway, I'm, I'm going in the wrong direction again. So, okay. Jill, Jill's got a comment, Skip. Okay, Jill. Well, I was just thinking after what Mark was saying that it's even bigger than just than Israel because I think it goes back to, to God's plan from the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. 
where he said, dress it and keep it. And, <clears throat> and it wasn't just about gardening. <laughs> you know, he gave them a beautiful, his plan was, you know, I'm going to be here with you and we're going to turn this little plot of perfection and we're going to spread it throughout the world. And, and I think this too, where it's, it talks about the oak trees and the gardens that um, in verse 29, you'll be, you'll be ashamed of the oaks which you've delighted in and disgraced because of the gardens you've chosen. Those are symbolic of, you know, when you think of the Garden of Eden, God put certain trees in there and, and gar gardens and flowers and fruits and whatever. And he's pointing out that they have chosen a different plan, a whole different plan with different trees and different gardens. And, and they don't want that plan that God set in motion from the very, very beginning. Um, <clears throat> and it made me think about, um, you know, when you mentioned tearing down statues and things like that, got me thinking about um, a family business. You know, if any of you know someone who's had family business maybe that was around for a long time and the dad built it up and it was successful and whatever and he brought his kids in to be part of the family business and then you get some of the kids who think who decide that they know better than the dad how the business needs to go the direction it needs to go they want to add new products or or have a different focus and and uh, you know, and, and everything begins to change and the dad gets pushed into the background as, as you know, the people, the kids who are the pushing and shoving for, you know, control and power. And, and you know, so that the dad just kind of at some point retires into the background a little bit. Um, and then, and then you sometimes have kind of like uh, God selecting Israel out of the rest of all the nations is that maybe it's, you know, you could have the analogy that the dad says to one of, you know, a couple of the kids who do want to, to continue things. Well, let's go over here and we'll start this small branch of the business and we'll keep things going kind of the way we had it planned. And the other son can just, you know, They've got their portion of the inheritance. They can go off and they can run that side of the company and do what they want. And I won't be kind of focused or helping with them because they think they know where they want to go and what's better. But over here, okay, you're the son or the daughter that, you know, sees my vision, and wants to keep it going. So we'll start this division over here and we'll kind of keep things going, you know, and it made me, think of how how that does actually you know has probably played out numerous times over the years of the generations in this world where um where that whole you know the initial plan has been uh, waylaid by choices that people have made you know um but i think this goes back to you know what god had originally planned in the garden of eden um and where we've gone down the road since then. Yeah, that's a, that's a good analogy. You know, I, I hate to say this, but you just described the savings and loan industry of the 80s, uh, where the, the new kids came in. It, it wasn't necessarily parents, but the new kids came in and had all these great ideas and ran the institution into the ground. I mean, I watched it. I watched it go on for several years. And when, you know, when I started in the savings loan business, there were 72 in Arkansas. And when I retired, there were two and we were one of them. And the reason we were one of them is because we stuck to our knitting as they, as, as they say, but it, your analogy is, is really good there, Jill. Thank you. Okay. So, in verse 31, he says, the strong shall be as toe and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together and none shall quench them. I'm taking you guys out. Now, again, down the road, things, you know, different story, but, but at least for now, 
you know, God's, God's going to fix this mess. He is sick of it. You know, uh, okay. Verse, uh, let's see, Isaiah 2, beginning in verse 1. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning who? Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Okay. So we don't know where when that is. Uh, you know, we're a lot closer to the last days than Isaiah was. But it'll come in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. In other words, I hate to use the word government, but I don't really know another. How about leadership? God's leadership shall be established on top of all other leaderships, or, you know, and shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow to it. Won't that be a wonderful time when, when and, you know, I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about when Christ is going to be, uh, you know, has, has landed in, in Jerusalem. And, and it says all nations will flow to it. And many people will come and say, come. Hey, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, and let's learn the way we ought to be doing stuff. And we'll walk in his paths. Skip? Yeah, Jim? You know, hating to refer back to worldwide, but having no other frame of reference, you know, it was always like in the millennium, we will be ruling over all of these individual nations, you know, as spirit beings and yeah. doing all of this stuff. And, and it really doesn't look quite like that. It looks like these other nations with physical real rulers will be coming to learn of God's ways. Uh, you know, it, I mean, not that those resurrected won't have anything to do with this, but it, but it appears like these nations, you know, I mean, these are physical rulers after Christ's return that have to go and learn of God's way and make a choice to do so. Am I yeah. making any sense here? I mean, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't well, you, seem yeah, like yeah, I mean, the, the point you're making is, I think is exactly right. These are physical people. These are people that, that, that either lived or were born in the, in, I'm going to go out on a limb and say in the millennium, this sounds millennial. Uh, many people, physical human beings, are going to go and sit at the feet of, of Christ or Christ's ministers or however you want to put it and, and learn the law of God and learn how to treat their neighbors and how to, to, to you know, how to, how to run a business, how to, you know, how to do all of these things. And it says, we will walk in his paths for out of Zion and Zion is, is a, a word for that area over there, Judea, Jerusalem, and so on. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. Okay, so th this, this kind of comes back to something Michael and I have talked about several times, and I think we've talked about it on here. And I said it a while ago, I don't think Christ is going to snap his fingers and everything's going to be fine. They're going to have to be taught. All of the humans in the millennium, if that's the time frame here, 
are going to have to be taught God's law and they shall be rebuked for the things that they did that they shouldn't have done. And, and you know, in a, in a kind way, I, you know, I don't, he's not going to beat them up. But anyway, they shall beat their swords into plowshares. It's metaphorical. And their spears into pruning hooks, metaphorical. But this isn't metaphorical. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war any more. Won't that be a, good, a wonderful time on this earth? We haven't seen it. The time is coming when the leadership of the world is so different that people will say, hey, let's go up and learn of the God of Jacob. And what does Isaiah say again in verse three? Many people will go and say, come ye. I don't have to read it again. You all got it. There's a better world coming. And here's why. He shall judge among the nations. And that's the one we just read. I don't know why I got redundant in this, but <laughs> I did. Uh, there, hey. Yeah, yeah my uh, as you're reading this, <clears throat> this came to my mind, and, and people may disagree with this uh, analogy or allegory because it's it, it, it's a poor one at best. But sometimes, uh, you know, looking at the current situation, you draw allegories and analogies from from things that we read uh, in prophecy in the future, and and sometimes they kind of help us see what God's doing. Um, there's a saying that that peace comes through the other side of warfare. And those of us that, that study the scriptures recognize that even when Christ comes back, uh, it's gonna, it's, a war is going to be required in order to bring peace. And the, the, the allegory is, if you look at it from our historical uh, understanding from uh, the end of World War II, uh, that was a, a war that we had to bring peace through the other side of war. And the allegory is, um, I'm looking at Imperial Japan as a nation that 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 you know was warlike and you know they bombed pearl harbor and whatnot and we had to wage uh, a horrific war to crush them to the point they were willing to surrender unconditionally on our terms and once that was done and that then peace could begin and then we set up in japan a whole new series of of of, of uh, laws and rules to the point where we rebuilt our enemy and uh you know taught them a different way of, of thinking uh in terms of restructuring their culture and society so they could get to the point where again it's a crude analogy where they can say let us go up and learn what the americans are doing so this th this seems to work and the the warlike nature that they had as an entire culture for millennia actually was subdued and changed now again it, it's a poor analogy because it's a physical uh, allegory, but I, I think in this context, uh, I think it kind of works a little bit in terms of looking what God's going to be doing at the end of the age with a bunch of nations that were warlike in order to change them uh, and get them to the point where they say, let's go up and learn God's ways and his laws because there's prosperity and peace that flows from that. I just thought it was interesting and thought popped in my head, so I thought I'd share it. Yeah, and and their their uh, their way of thinking is going to have to change. Now I'm assuming that the Holy Spirit is going to be uh, involved in this. That God is going to give people uh, his his Holy Spirit. On the other hand, they can be taught to observe the law and 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 so on. And then you know after they they well I don't want to, I'm sorry I I got way off on that. But yeah, good point. Not mine, yours. <laughs> there's never going to be another war of independence. Now, there's going to be a war at the end of the millennium as we understand it, but that's just a, you know, that thing may only last an hour. Uh, but th there's there's not going to be another war of independence. We're going to beat our spears into pruning hooks and guns will be mel melted down and used for farm implements. Yes, Michael. You'll have to give up your guns. Well, at that time, sure, I won't need him to defend myself that's from, right. you know, that's right. the, the, the devil. Yep. 
So, you know, why will that happen then when it can't happen now or certainly doesn't happen now? It's because of leadership. If you have perfect leadership, then what the people learn is going to be the right way to live and the right way to treat their neighbors and the, and the, the right way to, you know, to, to, to do, to, to do all of this stuff. There's a new world coming. It's going to be better than this one because the leadership will be better than the leadership that we have now. And you all would be getting a kick out if you, if you could see my, my notes, I've got the word government in here. And every time I see it, I'm changing that to leadership because I don't like that word. <laughs> and I think a lot of you probably know why, but I, I just don't like the word government. Yeah, was somebody going to say something? Hey, Skip, I would like to say that I don't see anything wrong with you calling it government. I think it may be, well, I don't know why. I don't see anything wrong with that because I think government is the ability of our individual selves to control ourselves. It is the way, it is the foundation of who and what God, the kingdom of God is. That is a picture of government. I don't think you should apologize for saying government. We're looking at a completely different type of government. When we become of the government where we love our enemies and that we base all of our decisions, all of our lives and all of our judgment on loving our fellow man. If we get to the point where we base our government of our bodies, the government of our minds, and the government of our world on the principles that Christ taught when he walked on this earth as a rep first representative of the kingdom of God, we should know government is cleansed. Government becomes pure. Government is exactly what it should be in when Christ walked on this earth. He was the predecessor and the prophet of the government to come. And I think God bless that government. I'm ready for it. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. And I, I'm sure most of you on here who, who have a past in the WCG know why I was, I'll, I'll quit doing that because you're right, Raymond. Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're past that. And, and I mean, my whole intro was that we need to, you know, get, get past our, our uh, the bad things that happened in our in our previous organization. So uh, you are exactly right. So that's Skip and well, Raymond. I think, oh, well, that was Randy. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Randy. Not, I, I I can't see who's I can't see who's talking. So sorry about that. I you know Randy just makes the point that uh, you know we have and we've talked about this before how today's society is co opted. The narrative that they've co-opted the meanings of words to where we have visceral reactions to words that used to mean something different you know <clears throat> and and get us to a point where we can no longer use them i mean for example my older sister's name middle name that she went by all the years we grew up was gay her name was gay and you know and at some point in the last 20 years or so, you know, you couldn't put your hand out and say, hi, I'm gay, yes. you know? So she now, she now has to go by her first name of Alex, just because that particular word had been co-opted to mean something so different that, that the, the correct use of it wasn't even, it didn't, in, you know, wasn't interpreted by people when they heard it. And I think that's happened to us with words like government. So. Yeah, good point. Uh, Skip? Yeah, Jim. Uh, I kind of agree with both of you that, you know, it's clearly government. That's mountains, right? But... I like you using the word leadership because they see the leadership in Jerusalem and they go up to learn of that way. You know, it's, you want to learn from good leaders. So, you know, I think it's sort of a, 
you know, I, I like the leadership because we, it's the leadership of Christ and his government that's going to attract these people to Jerusalem to learn of that way. And, and you learn from a good leader. And, you know, what has been the problem of all of these governments? It is the lack of good leadership. Yeah, and, and yes, Jim, I agree with that. But the problem completely is the hard heart of man. You can have tremendous leadership, but if you don't have a new heart in the man, a new uh, life, a, a repentant, then nothing, oh, nothing yeah, is going to take place. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's, 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 I guess it's a little of both. <clears throat> we need new leadership in our government. <laughs> How about that? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, you know, I, I just have a, uh, that, that word government was so misused previously. And uh, so I'm, I'm going to quit doing that. So anyway, Isaiah 2. Okay. Yeah. To defend, Skip, to defend you, Skip, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with your position. I mean, I'll, I'll, I mean, you look at how, as everyone, is, as Jim and, and Mark bring up, and as you bring up, you know, government's been so misused, not just from our church background, but look how it's being misused right now. I mean, you, we're going to need a, a complete overhaul in the understanding of what government is. And it's not this top-down thing <clears throat> in terms of uh, the way men do things, you know, top-down uh, leadership where the state's gonna tell you what to do or the leadership of the church is gonna tell you what to think and do. And God's way of top down is a little bit different in terms of you have a choice to make and he's gonna give you the power and the ability to make that choice and he's gonna help you. He's gonna start to build us up from the bottom up. Um, and I think that that's an important distinction to make. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Nate, okay, we won't have any more wars. Isaiah 2, uh, verse 5, we're going to go on in verse 5. O house of Jacob, come you and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Therefore, you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. What does that mean? Um, it, it means that, or the way I look at it, it, it that, that we have they or we have begun to receive their religion from the East. And we know how that has crept in, which we also have done. They're involved in every form of the occult and are looking for answers from anywhere and everywhere, but from God. And now we're talking about Judah, Jerusalem, Israel, uh, you know, in, in that area. Verse seven, their land is also full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasures and their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. They are wealthy. And that's part of the reason that, it, that, 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 that Jerusalem and, and Judah turned and went in the wrong direction. Now, I I latched on to this, this phrase, neither is there any end of their chariots. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. This is the LA freeway. How would you like to go to work there every day? Oh my goodness. Anyway, okay. So what's what's really striking about this to me is that the corruption of Israel, the corruption of the government of Israel, of old, of, you know, the government of old, of Jerusalem, Judah. Isaiah loved the city and loved the people. And, and he would ask, how on earth has this faithful city become a whore? The faithful city had become a whore at the time of their greatest prosperity. 
and we've seen that, you know, in, in this day and age. There was never a time when Israel and Judah had been richer, more full of goods and services, greater supplies of silver and gold, greater influences in the world affairs than they were at the time of their greatest moral and character decay. When they got to the top, that's where the slide occurred to get them to the bottom. They were rotten to the core. Um, Isaiah 2, 8. Uh, their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man bows down and the great man humbles himself. Therefore, forget, don't forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide into the dust for fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty. Because if you're not with God, you're in trouble. The lofty looks of man will be humbled. And the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. Now remember, this is talking about Israel. This is talking about, uh, you know, just before, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it is Israel, but it's uh, Jerusalem and, and, and Judea. It was. This is just before they are attacked and taken into captivity by Assyria. I say Assyria. Yeah, Arthur. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. <clears throat> um, in this section of scripture, uh, we have the term Lord, capital L-O-R-D, lowercase L-O-R-D, God, Jehovah, Jesus, and Christ. So my question is, which, uh, what does the word Lord mean? Uh, where is Jesus Christ in this section? Um, how do we determine which um, deity is being spoken of? Well, I know we have differences of opinions on this. Uh, my opinion is that in in most of these, it's it's talking about the the uh, uh, being who became Jesus Christ. But I know that there are other uh, other ways that that people look at this. Uh, do you want to take a shot at it? Well, you have to go back to the Hebrew, I believe, um, to without knowing Hebrew. But I mean, it's fairly clear that. Capital L O R D in the King James refers to the Father, and lowercase L O R D uh, refers to Master. Um, God is the Hebrew term is Elohim or mighty or powerful one, and Jesus is Yeshua or Joshua the Messiah. So we've been saying throughout this section here about Jesus and the Christ and so forth. But uh, we really haven't defined our terms clearly from the Hebrew background, which does make a distinction. Okay. Well, the Lord here, the capital Lord is Jehovah, uh, which is the self, if you will, the self existent one. I exist, I am. And. Sorry. I'm not, you know, not sure. I mean, if you know, if we're looking right at Jerusalem, and we're looking at physical people coming to Jerusalem, uh, then you know, at that time, I think we've got we're talking about Jesus ruling, and. I don't know. I get confused on it. I'm not. I'm not confused. The only reason because Yeshua, Christ the Messiah, and the Father are one. So we're talking about, you know, Jesus is the express will of the Father, so we're talking Yehovah. So, it, 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 I mean, it, it, I suppose it could be interchangeable. This is the will of the Lord at this time, 
and Yeshua or, or you know Jesus the anointed one is the one that's going to be making it happen so it's one and the same you know Jesus it's says kind of all, I of the above, will. all of the above is that what you're saying well yeah well yeah kind of or, or the, the Lord I guess and how it could be used with our understanding is Yehovah in this context would be referenced understanding prophecy as we do and knowing who Jesus was and what he's going to do when he comes back uh you know to this physical earth before it's burned up uh you're dealing with you know still at that time uh jesus the the king of kings and lord of lords still doing the express will of his father the ancient of days the i am so it's it's one and the same at least that's how i look at it well since, since yes i think i'd have to con i concur with michael that um it at this point it doesn't matter because he's jesus has always said i do the will of my father and if you've seen me you've seen the father and so they're unified in the plan that they are bringing about at this point in time um our difficulty often lies in the fact that we're human and we vi we we only identify humans in in singular individual forms so that there's only one Michael and one Skip and, and you know, one Arthur. Um, but the scripture, you know, when it comes to Elohim and, um, you know, the, there's Yahweh, the, the Father, the Almighty. But when Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen him, there's a unity there that is beyond the way we typically think when we think of people being in charge um and and so does it really matter do we need to identify who's doing what you know that seems a very human um re reaction we want to know who's in charge and exactly who how the pecking order works and who's the top dog and and in this case uh, you know i think that that simply all goes away when you're talking about the realm of godly leadership okay um uh, all right let's go on uh let's see do, 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 verse 12. okay for the day of yahweh the lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty you don't want to be proud and lofty after christ returns to the earth uh i don't think that's a good thing <laughs> and upon everyone that is lifted up and he shall be brought low and upon all the cedars of lebanon that are high and lifted up he's talking about groves where they worshiped uh, the false gods and so on. And, and where it, it was Solomon and, and that, that allowed his wives to bring their gods into uh, Judea. And then Jeroboam, uh, who, allowed, who just really messed things up in, you know, up in, up in the north, and changed the, you know, dates of holy days and so on. And upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains and upon all the hills that are lifted up, again, talking about different governments of, uh, you know, every, everybody better pay attention because God's here. And upon every high tower and on every fenced wall and on all the ships of Tarsus and all, you know, in, other, in other words, God, in my opinion, through his son at this particular time is in charge of everything and if he doesn't want it to happen it isn't going to happen and they're going to break down all these groves and there's there's not going to be people worshiping false gods uh the the law shall go forth from zion verse 17 and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. I think I just read that. And and Yahweh alone shall be exalted in that day. No other gods. And the idols he shall utterly abolish. Now, you know, here we could go in a little di 
different direction. You know, is 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 he talking about uh, the idols that people worship? Uh, you know, you, your car, your house, you know, these kind of things, or is he talking about the Elohim that we've talked about a few times? Uh, you know, it, it could be both, uh, it, but they're going to be abolished. Nobody's going to worship anybody else. Nobody's going to worship the, uh, the 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 Elohim of of, of Babylon. Nobody's going to wor worship the Elohim of the United States, if if there is one, and so on. All the idols he will utterly abolish. And they'll go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of Yahweh and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. If you're not on God's side, when this happens, there is nowhere to hide. You can try, but there ain't nowhere to hide. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats. There will come a time after Christ returns. I'm assuming this is still in a, in a millennial thing. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, write that in stone in my, you know, but my opinion is this is still a millennial thing. But Men will no longer worship their idols of silver and gold. And it, it, this metaphor here, they'll, they'll throw them to the moles and to the bats to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of Yahweh, for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. Again, this seems millennial. This seems like it's it's after Jesus Christ has returned to the earth and, and has begun the government of God from, you know, going out from Jerusalem. In verse 22, cease you from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted for? I have no idea what that means. Anyone, anybody want to throw that one out? <laughs> Isaiah 3, verse 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, and this is kind of what Arthur was talking about a while ago. Uh, to me, God's in charge. And he sent his son down to begin fixing the mess. So it seems to me that we're talking about the, the Christ. But, it, you know, I doesn't matter what I think. And I think you all know that. And I think you all know that I know that. <laughs> For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem and from Judah. This is who we've been talking about this whole time. Uh, so, you know, come to think of it, this would be before Babylon, not before, uh, this is before Babylon comes in. Uh, I, I believe, since it's talking about Jerusalem and Judah. But, He'll take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. When, when you get to the place where the whole government from top to bottom is filled with whoredom, when you get to the place where some of the highest officials are being indicted, and now I'm speaking more, I guess, of the United States, who are corrupt, who've broken the laws of the land and who are passing laws that you and I have to obey. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking the same things happening, you know, back then and that they don't have to obey. Something has to change. God is at the end of his proverbial rope. He has tied a knot into it. And he's hanging on. And I, you know, please don't take that wrong. I don't, I don't mean God has to hang on. But he's, he's done. How can God let something like that 
Continue. Revelation 20. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, a messenger come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and he bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. You know, Satan's influence on this earth from Adam and Eve on has messed everything up. He's he's caused us to have the wrong attitudes. He's had he's caused us to hate God. He and or to say there is no God, or to say that um, uh, you know I, I I came out of a one cell animal uh, out of the ocean that created itself. Being a little facetious here, and. This is the guy that's caused most of that trouble. But he's going to be bound for a while and out of the way for a thousand years. Now, one of the one of the reasons I think for the thousand years, Michael and I have talked about this a lot, is that God's not going to snap his fingers and fix everything. It's going to take a while. And uh, there's some other stuff that's going to be going on, which I've got later on. But Satan is going to be out of the way. His influence is going to be gone. But you know what? His influence isn't going to be gone from the people who survive the tribulation or whatever you want to call it. Those people still have that attitude of, of of Satan, in, in effect. And it's going to take two, three, four, five generations before everybody forgets and starts listening to God. You know, and that, that's the way I look at it. And that's, that's, that's why I believe this thousand years is a period that's necessary in order to get all of those bad thoughts out of the heads of human beings. So he's 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 going to bind Satan for a thousand years, and then he's going to be let loose for a little while. And you know we can talk about why is he going to do you know why is he going to let him loose and so on. And I, you know I, I can't help but think that the reason why is that. These these first generations, it took a long time for them to get those attitudes out of their heads. And then these new generations that never saw him uh, are, are, are going to see how bad a character that he really is. Now, that just, you know, that's a silly analogy. But anyway. No, it's not silly. I think it, there's a lot of merit to that. I mean, it, it, it's testing. You're going to have generations of, of people born in a world that's governed by, uh, you know, Jesus Christ from Jerusalem, where rivers of living water can be flowing, and there's going to need to be some testing. Are these people going to be, are they rooted truly? Uh, they're going to be warned in advance, and Satan's going to be let loose, and I think they're going to be tested to see whether they're going to follow God or they're going to follow, you know, the way human nature normally always goes, I think. At least that's how I look at it. Yeah. I, so, yeah, Mark. I, let's. I think that this is these sections that, that we're going through here in Isaiah is a lot about who is in charge, really. You know, those words that have to do with idols are derivatives of the word elim, which has which is tied back to the term el. Uh, so these, which, which is the root of Elohim. And so when we see these things about idols, it's about who's behind the silver. What's behind the gold? What's behind false worship? You know, God says very plainly not to make an image of something in the other dimension to worship. 
which were false beings or being not they not that not that they uh, the beings didn't exist but they were false gods they were false beings that were not deserving of worship and so then you go skip on down to chapter 3 for behold the the lord god of hosts so here we have something that is rendered in capital l small small letters um which mean which is adonai the boss the mighty one the 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 one that is let's see the master and the term god here is Yah is translated from the from yahweh so the the boss yahweh of hosts has to do with the military the campaign and then you see he is going to defeat the mighty man the soldier the judge the prophet this is all about who's really in charge now you you talked about the thousand years <clears throat> Um, really what needs to happen is a period of time or some time or something where man totally repents and turns to God. It doesn't, what, what if it's not a thousand years? Let me be strange to our ears from our history. What if it's not a thousand years? What if this is a lesson about who repents and turns to God? What if all of our linear understanding about revelation is cyclical, told in different ways, instead of a linear time blueprint? Would we see things a little bit differently, maybe? I'm not saying it's necessarily right. I'm just saying that there might be other ways to understand this. Uh, and so a time period of people turning to God and having a right relationship with him is fine but it may not take five generations. I mean, really what needs to happen is people need to repent and turn to God. That's all. You know, that's, that's a good point. And we've, we've talked about how, um, you know, we, we, Paul said we see through a glass darkly and, and we do. And, and you may be exactly right, Mark, even, even though, I mean, I, I don't know that you're, really trying to nail this down that you think it's 950 years, but <laughs> uh, yeah, it doesn't matter wh whether that's a literal thousand years or not. I don't care. Uh, you know, there's so many things that I used to believe that were so important to me that, that now I, I look at, as you all well know, I've said this ad nauseum, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, uh, that we're, we're saved by God's grace through our faith in Christ and not of ourselves and we can't earn it and all that kind of stuff. So many other things that I read in the Bible that, that could be metaphorical, uh, could be allegorical. Um, you know, I, I have questions about, you know, was, uh, you know, did Joe, did Jonah die? in the in the belly of, of the of the great fish and 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 did god resurrect him as a type of jesus you know those kind of things none of that stuff matters to me anymore um and and i, I think you're right mark uh, maybe we would look at things a little bit differently if we wouldn't try to pin them down uh because we've had a history of pinning everything down and knowing everything and uh, somebody asked us a question. We had to have an answer. We couldn't say, I don't know. So 
I don't know is good, but you know, Mark mentioned something. He asked, "What if Revelation is not linear?" And of course, you read it and it bounces back and forth. I don't think it's linear. However, uh, there are things that take place that are listed in the book that have not happened uh, yet on this earth, and so I would imagine that those things are, you know, when when there'll there'll be no more tears. <clears throat> And no more death. That's a very linear statement that I don't believe is is, is cyclical. Um, you know, where, where where death and the grave are thrown into the lake of fire and consumed. So I mean, in that regard, I think that there's probably a little bit of both. But I would think that there's there's linear aspects of, of revelation. Well, I think but, a better, perhaps a better word than linear might be sequential. That that they you know because they're laid out one after the other in the scripture does not necessarily mean that they will occur in that specific sequence so so i think maybe the word se sequential might be more specific than than linear because you know um linear is just along the line but sequence means this follows this follows that and and so while I agree that there is a linear, definitely a linear aspect to it, it may not be as sequential as is laid out in the in the book of Revelation. Yeah. Well, here's a question since Mark kind of opened up this Pandora's box here. Uh, do we get our understanding of the millennial rule of Jesus Christ to this earth when he returns based on verse two? Do we know? Or is that where it comes from? Are we making that assumption that because Satan is bound a thousand years, that that's the length of time that Jesus is ruling from Jerusalem? Uh, that's a good question. It, it seems like it's it's elsewhere. Of course, the, the word millennial means thousand, as I understand it. Uh, yeah, I'm just I'm trying to give some gravitas to what Mark is, is saying. You're like, is it going to be a thousand years? Could it be more than a thousand years? Does this binding happen after a period of time that after Jesus came back? I mean, that that's why I'm asking the question because I don't know. But well, let me let me box, throw let me throw something else in there. It's mentioned in verse three, by the way, also till the thousand years be finished. But there is there are many occasions when the word forever is used in the scripture and when you really analyze it it doesn't they some of them i'm not not saying all of them i'm just saying some of them don't mean forever uh, so could that be applied to this point a thousand years yeah I, I think you're exactly right it may be a thousand years it may be 900 it may be 10,000 uh, it's one of those to me does it matter things uh, I, now well isn't it interesting go ahead isn't it interesting that that in verse three he follows till the thousand years should be fulfilled and then he says and after that he must be loosed a little season well, how unspecific is that? You know, so it's a, an odd juxtaposition of a precise time followed by a very imprecise time. Yeah. So what are you supposed to take away from that? Well, I, I tell you what, I think, I think uh, uh, Mark has made a good point that um, we don't need to live and die with these things like the thousand year, it, you know, it has to be a millennium and so on. But, we, but but you have to be careful. Let me rephrase. I have to be careful because, you know, I, I don't really report to anybody, but I am coordinating a feast. And if I got way out of line, they would say, you know, well, hey, guess what? Uh, we don't need you anymore. But I, I just don't think all of this stuff make, it, it, is so important anymore. Uh, and I've learned it from, from you guys. It's all your all's fault. You know, so I hope you feel guilty that um, there's a lot of stuff that I used to uh, think was written in stone that's that's more written in jello. And this may be one of them. I still think it's a thousand years, but 
I don't care. Does that does that make any sense? No, it it does. I think one of our hangups is again we're talking about let's not bring up the, the past church background. But you remember one of the things that was, uh, you know, kind of we were I don't use the term indoctrinated to believe and understand is that you know everything about the plan of God was based on this blueprint timeline, and there's only seven thousand years. You know, and this first six thousand are the rule of man, and then the thousand years of God and Christ, and then bang, it's the end. And everything is absolutely precise. I don't know how many times I've heard ministers say, God has a specific time from when the sun rises to the second, to the millisecond, and the time it sets. And therefore, this timeline is immovable. And of course, you know, you you go through decades in the church listening to that. Uh, it it kind of gets set as a stone. So when you read things like verse three. Okay, there's a thousand years that Satan is bound and 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 locked up until the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Like Joe said, it's an imprecise, it's a precise measurement of time, followed by an imprecise measurement of time. Well, how long does that little season last? Is, is it you know a couple hundred years? Is it, it? We don't know. It doesn't say. You know. Um, so again, I think that it, it, it does throw. They could throw a lot of us for a loop, and I know a lot of people from our background would be very offended over the idea that the blueprint timeline that we were all raised with is suddenly thrown into some doubt. Not that it's completely wrong, but that the, the precise nature of how we measure time based on that blueprint is, is kind of up in the air. Although I still agree with Skip. I, I think the time after Christ returns till the time that we get to the great white throne judgment of second resurrection that Everything that takes place in between is a lot of it is building towards getting the earth ready for that 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 great second harvest. I still I still like that idea. I'm still kind of married to it. So until I'm shown differently, I'm still hung up on that. I think a little bit. Yeah, I, it, you know, it's how long it takes. Uh, if 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 it's if that's a thousand years, you know, fine. If it's less, if it's more. Uh, there again, I've gotten to the point where those kind of things don't matter anymore. Here's what I'm going to read this the way that what we've just discussed. I saw an angel come down from a, from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is a devil and Satan and bound him and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more. And then after that, he must be loose for a little while, you know, and I'm okay with that. Uh, but does it matter to you all if I'm okay with that? No, and it shouldn't matter to you all if I'm okay with that. So, I, you know, I think these are, are, are good points that we, we don't need to lock ourselves down with things that, aren't that critical to our understanding. I mean, does does it change our understanding that, that, that God is going to bind Satan if we think it may not be exactly a thousand years? No, it doesn't change a thing. And and like like Jill said, and you know, maybe maybe verse three is not a precise and then an imprecise. It could be two imprecises. Because we sure don't know what a little season is. Anyway, I, I, you know, I think this is good discussion. Let me, uh, let me, let me go on. Um, and uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Revelation twenty. Ver oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't see what John wrote. Uh, Michael, can you? Yeah, John says I think some of this regarding the fuzziness of time is really where God has revealed to us that. Uh, part of this plan is not bound by time since time was created for us and he is not in this realm limited to time. Uh, and that's interesting. Yeah. Um, a, a bad attempt at humor as far as, you know, this idea that, you know, our former understanding of exactly this, uh, the time may be flexible. Uh, I can't remember the scripture off the top of my head. Maybe someone knows, but isn't there a scripture in there that says when, when the bride has made herself ready? Uh, and how long does it take a bride to get ready? You know, maybe there has to be some leeway in there. A bad joke on my part, but, you know, I tried. 
<laughs> well, no, I was thinking the very same thing that, you know, if if you were going to this wonderful wedding that you'd anticipated, you know, whether it was your daughter or your or a close friend or somebody, you know, and it was supposed to start at four o'clock. If you were sitting there and at five past four, the bride hadn't come through the door yet, would you get up and leave because you figured you were at the wrong wedding? You know, um, I mean, it's just. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I'm like, well, wait a minute. That's a great, and that's not what I was thinking. You know, how long does it take a bride to get ready? Uh, some a little longer than others, maybe. You know, jitters and the hair's not right, and the spots are still have to be ironed out of the dress and all that stuff. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, so and then you address the the concept of time. You know, and anybody who's read C.S. Lewis, you know, in the in his um, I forget which book it is, but he he has a whole chapter on time. And how God does not inhabit time the way that humanity does, like you said, it, time is made for mankind. Um, and and you know, when you read that chapter, um, somebody tell me what the name of the book is. I've read too many of his. It's not. Uh, it's a C.S. Lewis, one of his most famous books. But anyway, oh, Mere Christianity. That's what it is. But he has a whole chapter, and he he in the chapter prior he says you may want to skip the next chapter and you kind of go huh, why is that you know and when you read the next chapter it's so it just asks you to get so far out of your box that that you understand why he made that comment after you've read, read the chapter and reread it and whatever about god not inhabiting time the way we do and that time Time, while it limits us as humans, it it has no um, impact on God. He created time, so it, it's just a really interesting concept that sometimes is uh, more than your brain wants to contemplate, depending on the day. Yeah, you know, there's a, 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 a Charles Charles Gross. Charles, you all know how close Charles and I are, and and. Uh, Charles has has heard. Uh, well, this isn't going to sound good, but uh, he he keeps hear, hearing uh, all of us talk about Ron, and you know, and he said he was going to get a little bell, and every time Ron's name's mentioned, he's going to go ding, 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 ding. So anyway, um, I have no idea what I was about to say. So let's talk about Ron. Charles. I don't remember. It'll it'll come back to me. I <laughs> Diane's in there laughing because I, I say things, things come out of my mouth long before my brain ever gets to, to part of the conversation. And we were <laughs> We were at a, a basketball game the other night. Our granddaughter, we got one granddaughter that plays in the seventh grade team and one that plays who's a senior. And we were watching the seventh grade game. And <coughs> this this one one young lady is a pretty good basketball player. And I said, I said, Diane, now remember, I'm watching the seventh grade basketball game. And I said, Diane. Kate's a pretty good basketball player. Is she in the ninth grade? <laughs> and it, it, about five minutes later, Diane came up for a breath because she'd been laughing so hard. And so my, I'm, I'm doing that more and more and, and, and more. I'm sure that didn't affect any of you all. But anyway, well, so let, me, let me go on. It's, since we're talking about time, one scripture. Revelation 1, 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Yeah. Yeah. We're already, what, 2,000 years past that one? Uh, exactly. Define soon. You know, speaking of time, you know, I, I'm, I, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I, I don't. I think the spiritual realm exists outside of time, which gets to what Joe was saying about C.S. Lewis. 
I think that time only exists within the physical creation uh, because that's how matter operates. That's how the material world operates. You have time that exists only there um, because of, of how it, it's made, how we're created, how it exists. In the spiritual realm, uh, where you know Jehovah and Jesus Christ, and this, that's outside of time. It, it's not bound by the rules of time. Our brains can't comprehend that. But the physical universe is uh, time exists only within that construct. It's not that God exists outside uh, or God created time for us. I think it's just time is a, is is a product of the physical uh, material universe. In the spiritual realm, the reality that we can't see, like the matrix. Um, exists outside of that. Those are just my own. That's how I rec uh, reconcile all this stuff about time. Well, not only not only that, but the, the way we reckon time. We reckon time based on how long it takes us to, to revolve, for this planet to revolve around the Earth, I mean the sun, or how long it takes this planet to re revolve around itself, or how long it is that we watch the moon go from we can't see it until it's full and then until we can't see it again. Maybe we're even looking at, at how we measure time wrong. I mean, let's just throw that in the, you know, in the mix. A thousand years may not be, okay, I, I'm going to quit. That's just getting into the no, we just blame Mark. We just blame Mark today for that. Yeah, we open, that's right. we Thanks, Mark. Mark. That's because I go by star dates, not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go, Jim. Are you happy now? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, Revelation, I think, twenty verse four. Then, then he talks about something that has to do with with man uh he says i saw thrones and they sat on them now we can go back and talk about the elohim and and uh god's council and and so on because this seems to be before our our resurrection but anyway i saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them and i saw the souls or the lives of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus seems to be metaphorical and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Here's that thousand years again. This is, uh, Michael, this is where it, it, it says it. Uh, and, okay, and, so did you brought it up. So Satan's bound for a thousand years and then uh, the saints are reigning with Christ a thousand years. Yeah. So we have both the, okay. Yeah. So however long that length of time is, let's just, let's just put it that way. Um, I lean toward a thousand years. It says a thousand years, but you know what? If God wants to do it different, I'm, I am not going to argue with him about it. I can tell you that right now. So uh, anyway, now, there's 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 cause for the change in the world that's coming. As astonishing as it sounds, we're going to have a part or have a chance to have a part in that change. Isaiah 59, 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and to them that turn from transgression in Jacob says Yahweh, and this seems to, to be talking about when Jesus Christ returns to the earth and lands on the Mount of, uh, the Mount of Olives. Uh, Zechariah 14, we're, we're all familiar with Zechariah 14. Behold, the day of Yahweh comes. And to, to me, that's the day that Jesus Christ is gonna land on the earth, but that's my opinion. Behold, the day of the Lord comes and your spoil shall be divided. And, I, and he says in verse two, uh, I'm going to gather up all the nations that, that, that want, want to keep this from happening. I'm going to gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken. 
and the houses rifled, and the women's ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. But then Yahweh will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now, we don't know how long that's going to take. I wouldn't think it would take very long if, if Christ has already landed, but, you know, who knows? And verse 4. One of my favorite scriptures. And his feet shall stand in that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall split down the middle. It's going to, sounds like, you know, it's going to be a big earthquake. When Jesus Christ hits this earth, bang, which we just had an earthquake here a couple of days ago. When, when, when he lands on the Mount of Olives, it, it's going to split in the in the midst thereof toward the east and, and the west. And that sounds like an earthquake to me. And there shall be a very great valley. So so uh, the, the, the formation of the land is going to change when Christ returns. And half the mountain shall remove toward the north and half of it toward the south. And then in Zechariah, it says, it shall be in that day. What day? I believe it's talking about the day that Jesus Christ lands on the Mount of Olives. It shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half toward the hinder sea, in summer and winter it shall be. This 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 river that that you know it's crystal clear. It's it's God's river, so it's it's a it's a pretty good river to drink out of and for fish to live in and and so on, and it's going to happen year round. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, there shall be one Lord and His name one. Okay. Um, this river is also spoken of in Ezekiel. Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward for the forefront of the house stood toward the east and the waters came down from under, from the right side. You know, the, where, where they're coming from to me is irrelevant. The point is this perfect spring is going to issue forth water. And and there's a, a crude drawing of it, I guess. Uh, I don't know about this, this the, you know, the, 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 the building around it and so on. Uh, there's, there's, you know, there's scriptures that talk about, you know, the, the throne and, and so on. So I don't, I don't know if, you know, when this thing is going to be built. But anyway, verse three says, when the man that had a line in his hand, and this was his job, he, he goes forth and he measures a thousand cubits. So that's what, 1800 inches, however long that, somebody divide that by 12. I don't know what it is. And he brought me through the waters and the waters were about ankle high. And then he went out another thousand. And the waters were up to the knee, so this this river is is uh, is is rising. And again, he measured another thousand and brought me through, and it was up to my thighs. And he measured another thousand. It was a river that I couldn't walk through, is what that means. For the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he's talking about by walking. And here's a, another crude picture of, of that. Um, it's, uh, you can see the trees that will, we'll, you know, I don't know if we talk about them uh, in the verses I have, but these trees have all these fruits. There's, there's fish in the water. The water's crystal clear. And guess what? It's going to go out and cover the whole earth. And I don't mean the whole earth is going to be flooded. What I mean is it's going to, it's going to touch the polluted areas of 
the earth and it's going to fix them. It's going to fix the waters. It's going to fix the seas. It's going to fix the rivers and the creeks and so on. It's going to fix the land. And, and, and this is going to be happening after Christ returns, in my opinion, during, at the beginning of the millennium. And I think it's going to take a thousand years. <laughs> you know, here we are back to the thousand years. It's going to take a long time for this wonderful crystal clear spring to cover the whole earth. Now, why does God want to do this? Why doesn't God just go zap? You know, it's just God doesn't work that way. And what he, what he seems to be doing here, based on our understanding of what happens after the period we call the millennium, is that all of mankind who was ever conceived, the reason I put it that way is that includes abortions, that includes uh, uh, oh, stillborn uh, miscarriages and, and all of that. I, I think it includes them because life was in them. Uh, but we got to get the earth ready for 59 billion people to be resurrected, to have somewhere to live after all of the pollution and all the, you know, the bad stuff that happens. That's the way I see it. Um, yeah. Um, it, it says here in verse 8 of Ezekiel 47, and then he said to me, this water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valleys and and enters the sea when it reaches the sea its waters are healed yeah now, can we take that as being a long process of healing or can we take that as a fairly quick process of removing the millions of tons of plastic and junk and all the rest of it we have put into the waters what do you think you know that's in an interesting question i've never thought of it that way before because all i've looked at is that the the polluted sea gets touched by this perfect water and and it clears up but i i hadn't thought about all the junk that we that we put in there there again we've got a thousand years or whatever time it is to uh, to get it fixed that's a good question arthur well, i wonder why i wonder why um it wouldn't be quick because after all i mean we don't know how humanity would have been spread around the world etc cetera, etc cetera. So it would seem to me that um, I'd like to see it being a miracle. Well, I'm, 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 I'm with you there. I, I see it as a miracle on, on the cleansing, the, the pollution in the water. Uh, but I hadn't thought about the, you know, all the junk we've, we've, we've put in there. That's a, it's still, it's a good question. But we know why it's happening, I, I believe. It's happening because 59 billion people have to have somewhere to live and they have some, they have to have something to drink and they have to have something to water their plants with. Cause guess what? If God doesn't change the water, one drink of the polluted waters, they're going to be dead. So God is cleansing the earth here. It's what it looks like to me. And it shall come to pass that everything that lives and moves, wherever the rivers come, so wherever this water is, uh, rivers, oceans, uh, uh, seas, uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, they, they shall live and there'll be a very great multitude of fish because these waters shall come there for they shall be healed. And there's Arthur's question. How long does that take? We don't know. We hope that it happens, you know, pretty quickly because it'll be, listen, you talk about some nice fishing. <laughs> you know, the humans that live through uh, all of the disaster uh, that, that want to go fishing, they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna be a, having, a, having a good time. But anyway, everything that shall 
that everything shall live where the river comes. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand on it from in, in, in Getty even to in Glam, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea ex exceeding me. I mean, there's, there's going to be fish everywhere. But the miry places... There, uh, so, yeah. so, so, so spe specifically, those places that are mentioned are on the Dead Sea. So okay. this water going down is flows down from Jerusalem into the Dead Sea. It's a metaphor for cleansing everything, no matter how inhospitable the environment is or the setting is for uh, life. I did not know that that's that that's where, but you, you're right. I mean, there's there's nothing more dead than the Dead Sea. Um, water. Didn't we talk about the Dead Sea once, isn't it? That one of the reasons it's dead is because there's there's an inflow, but there's no outflow, so it just kind of sits there. Is that? Didn't we have a study on that, Skip, or didn't you have one on that? I, I, that's what I've heard. Yes. Uh, yeah, the reason it's dead is unlike it's not living because there's 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 uh, water flowing into it, but there's there's the water doesn't flow out of it. Yeah, so it's not really living; it's kind of dead. That's that's what I understand. And and by the river on the bank thereof, on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees. And we saw that picture a, a minute ago for meat, whose leaf shall not fade. In other words. All year long, fruits coming out of these trees, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because the, their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be meat, and the, the leaf for medicine. Isn't that interesting? Um, okay. Uh, did I just reach the end of I sure did. So so what's the message here? The message is that God's going to set up his throne and that his goodness, his spirit is going to flow from there to encapsulate the whole earth no matter how dead it is and everyone will worship the king of kings, the lord of lords, the mighty God in his temple. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that because this this river that, that comes out is also, I I believe, metaphorical for the Holy Spirit is going forth from Jerusalem also, which is what you basically just said. Well, Skip, also you could look at what everything you just read <clears throat> from verse nine on as a metaphor for what God is doing with uh, mankind. You could yeah. read that into this as well. I mean, it fits. Yeah, I'm not saying that that's what this is, but I mean, I, I believe also it's going to be a physical manifestation, but it's also a spiritual one as well. Yeah, I think. But what what Mark just said? Can you say that again, Mark? Because that was that's a perfect uh, description of what we've talked about today. It's recorded. <laughs> that's true. Good point. <laughs> the, the real lesson is that. God is going to establish his throne in the heights of the mountains, which is the heights of everything that rules over mankind. And he is going to establish a relationship and that, and that his influence, his spirit, his power and might is going to flow out from his throne to every place, no matter how dead it is. And it is going to heal by turning everybody back to the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the ruler of all the universe, the destroyer of the false gods. And that is where we shall all turn to, to worship God in his holy temple. Yeah. Great. Amen. Except the Maori places and the marshes, those are not going to be healed. Those will be given over to salt. Yeah, we'll have to have salt for our apples. 
Well, you know, what's interesting is I remember some other verses in Isaiah re re referencing, I don't know if it's places in Edom that refuse, uh, you know, to follow God, that God is going to uh, disparage them forever. And I don't know if that's what this is in reference to or not. You know, and you've mentioned earlier that there are going to be people who, which is amazing to even consider, that are going to refuse to abide by the uh, King of Kings and the Lord of Hosts. And, of course, we know what their end is. <clears throat> and so, but there are some places, and you know, that are not going to want to follow God. And we've read that in the beginning, where Egypt doesn't even want to go up to keep the peace. Yeah, and they're going to have to be punished for it. So that's a good uh, point, Michael. That, that this Mari place is, is it could be metaphorical of, of people who choose not to not to be healed. Yeah, there are some nations of some sort, I guess. Now I don't know for certain. Adrian Davis did a real good study on, on, on a lot of this uh, in terms of uh, uh, Edom. And uh, and that could be in reference to this, that these miry places, the marshes, uh, that are not going to be healed uh, have to do with nations that absolutely reject and refuse. And that they're not, because they're, they're, their hearts are hard, they're, they're going to refuse. And so they're going to be given over. Now, that's an interesting term to be given over to salt. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that is a reference to, that they're going to be preserved as, as a, you know, a memory or a lesson. I'm not sure what that exactly means. Usually, a salt used as a preservative. Uh, yeah. Anyone have any thoughts on that? That'd be an interesting thought as far as what that means. I don't know. And it, as, as I think you said, Skip, I, I don't know all the details of what this is and what it is. I don't have to have an answer for everything. It's interesting. But like Mark said, the, the end of all of this is that God is going to do his will, that he's going to have a spirit flow from his throne and that every, you know, everything that needs to be healed will be healed except those things that refuse. And uh, he's going to reconcile all nations to himself. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. This is, this is the new Eden that remember was not the whole world. It started off, it was a place. God planted a garden eastward in Eden and put man in it. And they should have extended that kingdom, but they didn't. So this is a story, an account about God doing this. It is going to happen. He, because he is the almighty. You know, I, I hadn't thought about it that way before, Mark, but it, it was it was God's plan that Eden would be expanded to cover the entire earth. But 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 we messed up. Adam and Eve messed up. I, you know. Um, I, and what was their problem? Their problem was their heart did not was not subjected to God. Yeah. And that's the same problem that we have today. Mm -hmm. And God's plan is to be able to turn all mankind to his new Eden, to his, the new Jerusalem, to Zion, the new Zion, to the city on the hill. That's that, that account is repeated over and over and over in the scripture and the dark heart of man has to be conquered by the life-giving spirit that's really good there's a there's a contemporary christian song called city on the hill that um, uh, is very appropriate for for this um okay so there's a new world coming. Can I make a comment yeah, sure. on the salt sure um I don't know if it, it doesn't make much difference in the NIV. It just that particular verse just said, it says, but the swamps and marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. So it, it doesn't necessarily imply that that is a negative thing. It may, I mean, there are some amazing birds and creatures and things that live in swamps and marshy places. And it may just be a comment that salt has a, because the scripture has other good things to say about salt. Um, 
And so maybe this is just a mention that salt isn't going to go away. It'll still be available, but it'll be reserved over here in there'll be a particular spot where it's marshy and and uh, swampy and there'll be salt there. You know, it doesn't, does not, I don't think you can, uh, you know, definitively say that that is a, that there's something negative associated with that comment. Okay, yep. So, I mean, we've, we've been, we've been through all this and there's a whole lot of, there's a lot of other scriptures, you know, but like we, you know, like I said at the beginning and you all all know this and have said it yourselves, we've read the end of the book. We know what's going to happen. Nobody can stop it. People can choose to not be a part of it. And there will be some people that do that. I don't know why I don't understand it. I'm sorry. I'm absolutely lost. I've got uh, two really good uh, friends who are who are atheists. They're also liberals, and I'm not sure which is worse, but I'm kidding. <laughs> but I can assure you both of those guys are going to jump on this when God opens up their minds, you know, because they're nice people. And I just can't imagine who it is that's not going to want to live under God's rule. I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I, my brain just can't get around it. But anyway, there is a new world coming and it's going to be better than this one because it will be the government of God, not the government of man. And I, I love this nation. You know, coming back, to, and I realize all this has been talking about uh, uh, Judah and, and, and so on. But I love this nation. But if this is the best man can do, it's certainly not hard to see why we need Jesus Christ, the Redeemer, to come to Zion and to those and to turn those from their transgressions. And we should all be looking forward to those words, arise. Shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. That's what I got, folks. I've enjoyed it. I think I think we've had some some really good discussion today. Well, that's because Mark likes to open that box that he's got. Yes, he does. He's oh, really with he, all those 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 shiny things in there that are like, ooh, look at this. There's something to consider. Yeah, and it, my only response to, to Mark every time is, well, yeah, you you may be right, Mark, but uh, I don't think it matters. <laughs> well, m one of the takeaways on uh, Isaiah 3 that I thought was interesting because it's going through, you know, a lot of the bad stuff that society's in and tucked away in verse 10, there's just one scripture in the middle of it all, and it just says, tell the righteous it'll be well with them, for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. And then it goes back into the, you know, the bad woe to the wicked and disaster upon them and all that kind of stuff. But that one little positive thing in there, it, you know, just tucked away in the middle of all of that. And I thought that was interesting in the middle of the disaster. Tell the righteous it will be well with them for they will enjoy the fruit of their deeds. It's encouraging. Yeah. That gets to, I think it was Paul said, don't, don't weary of doing good works. You know, when you live in an age of lawlessness and wickedness, you know, I guess it, it, it's human nature and I've run on this to myself, why even bother to do good? Because there's so much wickedness around you, it's just consuming you. So it'd be easier to go with the flow than to stand for righteousness and judgment because, you know, um, it, it, you don't take any risk to yourself. And of course, God says, well, where are those to lament and groan and anguish over all the evil that's being done in the land? Um, you know, and, and those, those that want to do righteousness and goodness, I think those scriptures, like the one you just read, Joe, is encouraging to say, listen, you're going to enjoy the fruits of standing up for righteousness and, and justice. 
um, you know, even though it, the rest of society is, you know, going off the cliff, as it were. Um, so, yeah, that is encouraging. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. And don't, don't forget that on the 11th of December, which is what, two weeks away, I think? Let's see, the 27th, it'll be three weeks away. Um, I'm going to have to use our, our go to meeting uh, for uh, Sharon's uh, uh, celebration of life. Barb says she may not be here due to thank. Oh, yeah. What about Thanksgiving? Do you all want to uh, just watch something online or, you know, because I, I imagine everybody's going to have uh, some family or something going on. So what do you all think? Yeah, that, that applies to Wednesday, too. And, and uh, I, I know last I'm with this past Wednesday, you weren't able to make it because of all your issues, but I wrote in that email that I didn't know what you wanted to do as far as Wednesday night Bible study. And I guess next Sabbath, that would be your call skip. Okay, but what did you mean by all my issues, Michael? Well, you started what you started the program with today. <laughs> Please pray for Skip and all his issues. And yeah. we know there's myriads of them. Yeah, Di Di Diane could, could fill in a few blanks there about all my issues, so. Uh... Yeah. Well, all right. Well, listen, this was, a, I thought this was a great, uh, a great discussion today. Of course, you know, God gave us the scriptures to talk about, you know, and uh, uh, he's got some pretty good, he's got some pretty good stuff to talk about. And uh, so anyway, okay. Anybody? Well, wait, yeah. wait. We never answered the question. What, what do we want to do about next next uh, so Wednesday and Sabbath? I, my own suggestion to you, Skip, would be especially Wednesday, probably no, just because everyone's going to be traveling and whatnot, and you're probably going to have two or three of us on at, at most. Uh, and then I don't know what you want to do about Sabbath. That's up to you. I'm, I'm going to say no on both of them unless you all tell me right now to do both of them or one or the other. How about that? Well, how many people would be interested in, in getting together next Sabbath? We are going to be here in town. We're not traveling. Okay. All right. Um, well, how about this, Skip? So we can give you a break, and it's before my oral surgery, so I could probably kind of sort of lead it. Um, why don't we talk about Thanksgiving on next Sabbath, since it's after Thanksgiving? Why don't we talk? I could bring up some historical stuff about uh, the first Thanksgiving here, and we can talk about the general nature of uh, being thankful and giving thanks. How about we do that? Okay, that sounds good to me. So those of us who can make it, well, you all are going to get the email anyway, but I, I need to know about this oral surgery. Is that just something you all talk about? Eh, no, I, I've got to have, I've, I've got some, I have my own issues, Skip. Yeah. Um, I, I, have, I have surgery happening in early December, and I don't know what my condition is going to be like once that's done. Probably not going to be, uh, when you said the 11th, I thought you were going to ask me to lead. And thankfully, that's not the case, because I'm like, no, I won't be probably functioning very well. Yeah, you, uh, yeah. Uh, like, you had this problem a, a month or so ago where you, you were out of commission for a while. Yeah, no, this is the other side. This is the other, uh, you know, when you go to the dentist for a cleaning and they go, ooh, wait a minute. You know, like, why didn't you guys catch catch this, you know, back in February? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> Well, the thing is, there's so much time because they're so backlogged because of the, the COVID lockdowns that, you know, to get in to see your dentist is, is measured now in months instead of, you know, a few weeks. So, um, yeah, the, the dentist wants to, to basically do some major things for me, and I will not be in a position to do any kind of talking probably on the 11th. So, thankfully, you didn't ask me to, to lead that day because I, I wouldn't be able to. Okay, but I will ask you to... Lead us in a closing prayer. Oh, okay. I can do that. Our great almighty father, Jehovah, the ancient of days, we gladly come before you with thanksgiving in our heart and praise to you, father, that we are able to gather in the name and by the authority of your son, uh, Yeshua, your anointed one. Uh, we praise and thank you, father, for this time that we've had together to be able to sharpen iron, to hear your word expounded on, to sharpen iron with one another, with the, um, our understandings through your spirit to help give us a better picture 
of your plan, what you're doing with us, that we can have hope and faith and trust in you and your word, which does not return void. We're thankful that we've had this opportunity today. Uh, we lift up all those, Father in heaven, that um, uh, are, are, are afflicted and uh, overcoming issues. Uh, we're praying for the Cup family, uh, praying for all the Skip's issues, um, you know, and whoever needs healing, we're praying would reach out and touch them and, and, and your will be done for each one of them. Those that are traveling uh, this week, we're praying for uh, your protection upon them. And we give you thanks, Father in heaven, as, as a nation, we set aside this week to uh, pause to give you thanks for our national blessings. And as we give you thanks for that also, we thank you more so, Father in heaven, for your Holy Spirit, which we were reading about the depiction in your word in Revelation about that river of life flowing out that will encompass the whole world. And we're so grateful, Father, that we have a our own small individual role to play in pointing people to you, to point them to that river of life, because you desire all of us to be an attorney forever with you and your son. And we pray, we praise you for that. And so, Father in heaven, we uh, ask for your dismissal now. We ask for your protection on us, and we give you thanks and praise. And ask all these things in the name and by the authority of your son, Yeshua Christ the King. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Michael. All right, I'm done. So, uh, wow, I don't know how that happened, but my screen got big. Okay, so uh, with thanks. some of you all, yes. Thanks. Oh, thanks for, for your contributions. Uh, you all you all make this thing. Uh, you, you make my job easy. Uh, all I have to do is write down a few scriptures, and here we go. So uh, anyway, it's uh, it was a great discussion today, and I, I appreciate it. So thanks so much, folks. Thanks a lot, Bye-bye. All right, thank you all. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kim.